So I want to welcome everyone to uh, a workshop on a biblical perspective on self-harm, uh, led by Julie Ganshaw. Uh, as you can see on her graphic, she is a PhD candidate. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm very grateful to have a trusted friend and colleague, Julie Ganshaw, here with us today, um, bringing her expertise to speak on a very important topic. For those of you who are certified counselors, interns, or students, I really believe you're going to be better equipped after today to bless those God brings to you for help with the struggles that we're going to be discussing. And if you're not a counselor or enrolled in you know, one of our courses or another program, I encourage you to pray about learning more about certification or training. Uh, these programs are created for everyday, the everyday Christian, not just pastors or seminary students. And we truly believe these programs help to equip the body of Christ for true discipleship and to give you tools and resources for walking alongside sisters and brothers in Christ. Uh, following our time together today, you will receive an email with information on how you can learn more. And of course, please feel free to reach out with any questions. So let me introduce to you Julie Ganshaw. Julie has, an extent, has extensive experience in biblical counseling and serves the biblical counseling world in many capacities. She's the director of Reigning Grace Biblical Counseling in Kansas City, Missouri. She serves as a training center director with IBC, International Association of Biblical Counselors, with ACBC, the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, is a board member of the Biblical Counseling Coalition, and sits on the advisory board of Fallen Soldiers March Biblical Counseling Network. She's also finishing up her doctoral thesis for a soon-to-be-awarded PhD in Biblical Counseling. Um, I have, personally have a high regard and deep respect for Julie, and I consider it an honor to partner with her administering the healing power of the living word of God and training and equipping everyday believers to be effective biblical counselors and disciples. So welcome Julie and it's all yours. Wow, well thank you Warren. I hope I can live up to all that. <laughs> I, uh, the, that was actually the first time I've heard anybody talk about the doctoral part and I have to admit it blew me away. So um, it's really my pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, this topic that we're going to talk about today, a biblical perspective on self-harm or self-injury, it's really crucial, I think, in the biblical counseling world for us to be equipped to help uh, those that are struggling with this. You know, back when I was a kid, um, way back in the Stone Ages, you know, when people would... Um, cut themselves or stab themselves with pins or needles. We just thought they were weird. And we thought that they were, um, you know, the troubled kids, the troubled kids that would be in our high schools or our junior high. But I will say that um, over the past 25 or 30 years, uh, this type of behavior has completely exploded in our culture. And the kinds of self-harming behaviors that people are dealing with are much more um, harmful and much more extreme than the kind of stuff that um, I was involved in and the, the kind of behaviors that I was familiar with, even from the time I began um, as a new biblical counselor way back um, 27 or 28 years ago. So I'm going to begin today just by talking about some of the basics of self-injury and some of the basics of counseling those that are struggling with these behaviors. Uh, I'm hoping that we can be quite interactive um, in our time together um, because I think you probably have a lot of questions and Lord willing, I will have good, solid biblical answers to give you. I'd like for us to, before I do that, I'd like for us to pray together and ask the Lord's help and wisdom as we um, begin our time. So bow with me. 
Father, it is a privilege for me to be able to meet with these folks today um, through this wonderful media of Zoom and to, to teach them truth about this behavior that is so often misunderstood and um, misdiagnosed in the secular world. And Father, we are here to learn what your word has to say about how to help these uh, people that struggle with various kinds of self-harm. Thank you for this opportunity to share the wisdom that your word contains and the wisdom that you've given me through practical experience. I do pray that you would be honored and glorified by our time together and that the students viewing this today and those that will view it in other ways would be helped and that they would receive solid truth and that above all, Lord, you would be glorified. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's get started here. Um, what I am presenting to those of you that are already certified or have a history in biblical counseling, some of it might be rather basic to you, but I think it's important that we lay a solid foundation um, together so that you'll know where, where I'm coming from and how we help uh, self-injurers at Raining Grace. Um, Self-injury is actually a behavior that has been around since ancient biblical times. Um, in 1 Kings 18.28, we see um, idol worshipers who slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. Um, that was a form of self-injury. Um, Self-injury was also found in ancient Greece and in the Middle Ages when it was common for people to self-flagellate. You may have seen this before in, you know, dramatized things or in, um, you know, in movies or read articles on it where they would create cat of nine tails that had either bone pieces or sometimes they were just leather strips and they would flagellate themselves like this as a method of penance or as an offering to whatever God they were serving. And even in um, Catholic church um, during the, uh, um, I believe it was the Elizabethan or the Edwardian era, uh, this was a common practice. In the late, late 19th century, there were two American doctors that reported that there were women all over Europe that were puncturing themselves with sewing needles. In fact, this practice became so common in Europe that they developed a name for these supposedly hysterical women who practiced this form of self-harm. It was They were called needle girls. So this behavior isn't new. It's been around since um, ancient days. And you should know that self-mutilating behaviors occur among all social classes. They are among all genders and ethnicities. So there's no, um, there's no group of people that are um, immune to self-harming behaviors. I'd like to share with you a story of a counselee that I once had. Um, I will call her Rebecca. Uh, she was a 17-year-old young woman who was in the local Bible college in the town that I lived in, in Wisconsin. When Rebecca came to me for biblical counseling, she was actually referred by the school because they were very concerned about some of the things that they observed in Rebecca's behavior. For one, um, Rebecca always wore long sleeves and pants, and um, she always wore hats. And the school found that to be a little concerning and a little bit confusing, especially since it was often hot. Um, in fact, the day that I met Rebecca, she came with her long sleeves and pants, and it was 101 degrees outside. Now, as I got to know Rebecca, what I learned about her is that uh, she was a self-injurer. It was clear the first time that I saw her that uh, part of her self-injurious behaviors were hair pulling. Uh, she had no eyelashes, she had no eyebrows, and what I learned is that her penchant for hats was actually more to disguise the fact that despite the fact she had very long hair, she had giant bald spots on her head from pulling the hair out of her head. 
Um, I eventually saw dozens of scars up and down her arms and her legs where she had repeatedly cut herself and then picked off the scabs um, from her cutting. She also had numerous burn marks um, from cigarettes and lighters. And the funny thing was, is Rebecca really wasn't a smoker. It was just how she uh, was able to harm herself in a way that felt good to her. Some, let's see if I can get this to work here. There we go. Uh, a definition of self-injury or self-harm would be, it's an attempt to intentionally ha cause harm to your own body. And the injury is usually severe enough to cause tissue damage to some degree from superficial scarring to permanent disfigurement, including even amputation or mangulation of the body in extreme circumstances. Contemporary literature on self-harm produces this phenomenon to varying extents around two key characteristics. The first is that this behavior is predominantly performed by those identifying as female, although males do do this. Secondly, the behavior primarily involves cutting the skin with burning as the most second popular method of self-harm. Some examples of self-injury or self-mutilation. They're not limited to cutting or burning or hair pulling. There are also um, things called eyeball pressing, which is um, something that you would normally see in somebody that has other emotional issues or somebody that has, uh, takes a, a lot of medication. And uh, you know, just to give you an idea, you know, they press on their eyeballs so hard and the eyes are very delicate uh, tissues and they're very pain, you know, it's very, very painful to press on your eyeballs this way. It causes the intraocular pressure to go up very high. You can cause retinal damage, retinal tears, but um, you know, this is a, a behavior that some people undertake. Um, you also might find eyeball pressing being done by an autistic person or someone that does head banging. Um, and this is not considered self-harm in this case, in those cases. It, it's just part of the autistic behavior. Um, a person who self-injures also might bite themselves. Now, this might be on the younger end of the spectrum. Uh, frankly, I've never seen an older self-harmer that bites. And usually, you know, you, you can see the teeth marks up and down their arms or their legs. Um, you're pretty limited in where you can bite yourself that you can reach in a lot of cases. Uh, picking at scabs or interfering with healing. Um, picking at the scabs or the skin until the skin is damaged uh, is pretty common. I know an older gentleman who picks at his head. He picks at, he's got this space about the size of the palm of your hand on the back of his head where he no longer has hair, um, but he just picks and picks and picks and picks at his head. He's created little sores there that bleed. Then he picks off the scabs. Um, so he, he doesn't allow them to heal. And, and uh, he's always um, bloody and, and it's actually pretty awkward to look at. Um, punching yourself. Uh, this would be a, a behavior that more of a young guy would undertake more than a girl. Uh, punching yourself until you're bruised and um, till you have these hematomas under your skin that are large and um, black and blue. Um, extreme nail biting is another self-injurious behavior. Uh, till there's no, literally no more nail left. It is bitten so far down to the skin and the skin is chewed all around the fingers where uh, there's no more nail in an attempt to actually get at more nail. Um, not ever allowing your nails to grow. And it doesn't, it's not only the fingernails, it can also be the toenails that are bit like this. And then there is the extreme forms of self-injury bone breaking, uh, hitting yourself with a hammer, hitting yourself with other objects. Now these are clearly severe forms of self-harm. 
Now, I can't honestly say I've ever seen anyone in my office that has broken their own bones like this. But uh, as I was contemplating this, I really wonder if some of the more extreme activities that we've seen popularized, for example, in that movie, I think it was in the 90s, and pardon the title, but it's Jackass, uh, where these people hurt themselves with extreme, by doing extreme activities, you know, that is a form of self-harm. You know, they're disguising it as humor. But what normal person does those kinds of things to themselves just to be funny? So I've often wondered if those kinds of behaviors are, are really examples of public acceptable self-harm. Also, something that might be a surprise to you is um, anorexia or severe dietary restriction as a form of self-harm. It's important to understand that anorexia or purposeful starvation is a form of self-injury. And it can accompany other forms of self-harm like cutting or hair pulling, and it can act as a gateway to further forms of abuse. Those who are um, diet restrictors are often very perfectionistic. They're people who can never be perfect enough in their own minds. And they also try to hide from their feelings, which creates an environment in which things like cutting and self-injury, other forms of self-injury can thrive. So how do I know if I am dealing with a self-injurer? Well, one of the ways that you'll know it is if they're wearing clothes that are covering their body when it seems inappropriate to do so. You know, when it's 95 degrees outside, or, you know, even if it's just warm outside and everybody else is wearing shorts and tank tops, and <clears throat> the person is wearing long sleeves and pants, or they're just extremely covered up and they're unwilling to pull up their sleeves, or, you know, that can be an indication. Now, Obviously, that's not the only criteria, but uh, you'll notice that the person's behavior is maybe a little bit altered. They may be quiet or secretive or just have other for, you know, other affects that make you wonder if there's more going on here than what's really meeting the eye. Um, another possible sign of self-injury and self-harm is if a person has a little kit of things that they keep, uh, which would contain like a razor blade or a small knife or a lighter when that kind of thing is out of place. Most of the self-injurers that you'll meet really do limit their self-injury to cutting and um, burning and hair pulling. So, you know, little kits like this um, when found in a bedroom or in a backpack would be a clue that the person's a self-injurer. Also a person who has numerous accidents okay they're always bruised they're always bleeding they're always in the doctor for some kind of injury that they've sustained could be a form or could be an, a sign that the person is a self-injurer now cutting or self-injuring is always a part or a component of a much larger problem right some of the associated problems that are um, uh, go along with self-injury would be a drastic food reduction or anorexia, as previously noted. What's known in the secular world as borderline personality disorder, okay? This is a psychological term for behaviors that are biblically considered to be pride, self-seeking, self-gratifying, self-worshipping. And it's important that when you're meeting with somebody that comes with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, that you help them to reframe this in a biblical context. This will remove it from um, the, the world of being a, um, a medical problem uh, because there is no medical component to borderline personality disorder or to these the thoughts, beliefs, and desires of a person that displays these behaviors. And it will help bring it into the biblical realm where you can deal with them um, from that perspective. Um, people that deal with these behaviors, okay, they're, they are absorbed by the pain 
in their lives that they are experiencing. And they're often really dependent on people instead of being dependent on God. They frequently demonstrate a lack of self-control in a number of areas in their lives. Um, or they may also demonstrate hyper-control, where they are so controlling about different aspects of their life that the, the in self-injurious behavior is the only way that they choose to deal with it because everything else is so far out of their realm of control. Uh, they are often impulsive in other ways. Um, you know, they appear to be sometimes very carefree about how they're um, handling things in life. You know, they may be the, um, the kid or the young adult that seems to have it all together when in reality they are harboring all of these concerns and cares in their life that uh, they have no ability to express. Um, they may respond in sinful anger to um, things that you wouldn't expect them to be angry about. Um, more of a, um, an explosive type of anger that seems to come out of nowhere. Uh, Self-injurers can also be very flesh indulgent. Um, they're very feeling oriented rather than God oriented. And they definitely don't have a biblical view of self. So uh, those are some of the components of a person with you know, the borderline personality uh, who will be a self-injurer in addition. Um, the self-injurer also may struggle with a diagnosis or have the symptoms of depression um, or sadness. And it's important for you as the counselor to identify their, their uh, word depression as sorrow without hope. Uh, biblically, that is what depression is. And so we want to make sure that when we're talking to them, we, you know, refer to what they're dealing with in biblical terms. They may also appear to have low self-esteem. Now, biblically, again, low self-esteem is an, an inordinate focus on self, what the Bible calls pride. Um, and that might be a curiosity to you, depending on how much training you've had in biblical counseling. Um, we can talk about that in the... And, you know, as we interact with each other, if that's something that is confusing to you or new to you. Um, the self-injurious person does think very highly of themselves. Um, on some level, they believe that they shouldn't be experiencing the pain that they're experiencing, that they should somehow be exempt from what it is that has befallen them or um, the situation that they find themselves in. Sometimes um, self-injurers will use their behavior even as a manipulation to gain attention, which is you know, counterintuitive to what I said about them not you know, wearing long sleeves and everything. But there are some people that self-injure that do it to get the attention. Um, typically, young teenage girls, when they're discovered, they use it as a tool of manipulation to get their parents to do what they want them to do. You know, if, you know, if, if I don't get my way, I might start hurting myself again. And so the parents are very bound um, to pleasing their child because they're concerned about the behavior. So their entire focus is really on themselves. Uh, this is a violation of passages of scripture like uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Matthew 22, verse 39. And, and you want to point that out to your counselee if they're self-injuring. Uh, self-injurers also frequently have a high level of anxiety. And the anxiety can be from without, okay, outward to inward, meaning they've got circumstances that they're very anxious about. And then they respond inwardly to outwardly by the self-harming behaviors. Um, Self-injurers self also are impulsive and they have poor self-control. Now, my, my uh, self-injurer, Rebecca, she was, rather than being anorexic, she was also an overeater. 
she was really overweight. She was cherubic in her appearance. And like I said, she was a student in a small Christian college. And she did describe herself as somebody that had low self-esteem. And I found her to be quite immature emotionally for her age. She presented herself as really kind of this happy-go-lucky person. Um, she would be the, or she was the gal that on her notebooks, she would doodle flowers. Um, she was always drawing flowers, you know, daisies and, and daisy chains and, um, you know, smiley faces, uh, lots of stickers on all of her stuff, um, which I found for a 17-year-old college student to be just a little bit too far over the edge, you know, as being a little abnormal in the immaturity realm. Um, she was the youngest in her family and she was very emotionally needy. She was quite childish and she was a gal that had issues with her mom. Her dad was not in the picture. Um, she had an older brother and a couple of nieces by this older brother whom she absolutely adored. She loved being their aunt and wanted to be very involved in their lives although her brother and sister-in-law had distanced themselves from her um, for reasons that she struggled to articulate in the beginning. Uh, the school sent Rebecca to me um, after I spoke on the issue of self-harm there, and they realized that they had reason to be concerned about her behavior at that point. Well, usually the self-injurer is not suicidal, and Rebecca was not suicidal either. Um, the self-injurer is typically careful about how they injure themselves so that they don't require medical intervention. For instance, most self-injurers will not Cut, oh, do cut here. They are very shallow cutters, so they don't hit that major artery. Typically, a self injurer does not want to end their life. They will tell you they just want to feel better. This is in you know contrast to the to the suicidal person who will intentionally cut over an artery, or they will perform a behavior intended to take their lives, such as slashing all the way up their arm deeply and for those of you that watched um the 13 reasons why movie if you could or series if you could stand to watch the last episode where the young woman in that video or in that series that was frankly the most graphic um suicide scene i ever watched and i had a hard time watching it and i've seen a whole lot of things but it was clear that the character in this movie intended to take her life. She just cut all the way up the inside of her forearm. So a suicidal person, rather than just making the normal small cuts in their arms or legs, will cut over a major artery or they will do something like hang themselves, gunshot wounds, or they will take an overdose of pills to the, combined with alcohol that they know is gonna kill them. Now, my counselee, Rebecca, was not suicidal. Uh, she told me that her behaviors were unconscious. That was the word that she used. She said she wasn't even here. So she would sit and twirl her hair like this, and the twirling would become more and more intense to the point where she was pulling the hair out of her head. So self-harm and suicide don't usually go together. The reasons for self-injury, well, you know, this stuff begins in the preteen years and in the teenage years. Uh, these are traumatic times in the lives of these young people and young adults, especially in our culture. And since I began seeing self-injurers, these behaviors have begun at younger and younger ages, and the pressures have become greater and greater and greater on these kids. Um, typically, uh, 
our teens and our young adults are being presented with decisions and choices and circumstances in life that they are just not emotionally or spiritually mature nor equipped to handle. Uh, for example, the, teenage, the teenagers, they have greater pressures on them than at any time in history, right? And it, I'm not talking about the teenage years in ancient Bible times where these were people, young adults that were considered adults. These, these young kids in Bible times are getting married at 12, 13, 14 years and running a family and running a home. Okay, but these were people that were prepared for this from the time they were young. Work was a way of life for them. Responsibility was a way of life for them. And that is just not so in our culture. We have created for our teenagers and our young adults this culture of never growing up. Um, the, you know, kind of the Peter Pan syndrome where, you know, it's common for young adults, rather than getting jobs and being productive members of society, they are encouraged to have no other responsibility other than to um, go to school and play video games or be very good at whatever sport that they undertake. There's, you know, their academic pressures can be enormous. And in some cases, you know, the, um, the college preparation begins in the eighth grade where they have to decide what you want to be with your life so that you can take all of the AP courses in high school and all the college prep courses that you want to take to do what you want to do after you graduate from high school or to get in the college that you want to get into. I don't know any eighth grader that is emotionally or um, it just mature enough to be making those kinds of decisions, and yet they are often placed in those kinds of circumstances. There are many high school students that are working 20 plus hours a week in order to save for college, in addition to attending their regular everyday classes and doing homework for their AP classes and playing some sort of sport for the purpose of getting them an academic scholarship. Teens are also being given really mixed messages about their relationships and about their sexual orientation. And sadly, it's not only teenagers anymore. With the whole um, LBGTQ agenda that is being promoted now in some states that it begins in kindergarten and in um, you know, the primary grades and kids are being fed um, you know gender um, transgendering hormones and being encouraged to live by their you know their feelings of you know identifying as the opposite biological sex okay these are extremely damaging mixed messages for these kids to get um, in addition to these kinds of mixed messages, there's also the sexual freedom culture in which we live, where because there's very few morals and values that are being taught, um, none in public education, and even in Christian homes where you know sexual discussions are repressed or never had, the only form of teaching and training that kids are getting is through television, um, videos, and interaction with their peers. Sometimes churches will undertake, you know, teaching young adults about sexuality, but that is, you know, not always popular among the parents. So that may not even happen. So what we have is a whole culture of kids that are having numerous sexual partners. Um, we get PDIs in our counseling center with kids that are 17, 18 years old that will identify having hundreds of sexual partners at that age. And these are Christian kids, kids that have been raised in Christian homes that are, you know, struggling with what the culture says and what the church says and what mom and dad say. And they don't know what to do with all of this information. 
And so they carry a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, um, particularly if their sexual activity has resulted in a pregnancy and a secret abortion. And so they're um, turning to self-injurious behaviors to try and deal with that. So our kids are pressured to be sexually active long before they are emotionally, physically ready to do so. These kids are being put in situations they are, they are just not ready to handle. They're dealing with broken homes, um, spending alternate weekends with mom or dad, and the pressure that comes from being in the middle of a divorce. And these are only the normal kinds of stressors that our kids are dealing with. This doesn't cover the, the cases of extreme kinds of situations where there is sexual abuse going on in the home by a parent or a step parent, drug or alcohol use in the home by the parents who encourage in some cases their kids to join them in these behaviors, out of control siblings that may be raising the tension in the home, uh, same sex unions, sexually transmitted diseases, abortions. You know, these kids are coming to believe that there is nothing they can count on in their lives that is stable or that is unchanging. And so they talk to each other. Um, they don't know who they can really trust, who is really gonna tell them the truth, particularly in homes that are broken or split or where, where the parents aren't Christians and you know they're content to send their kids to church youth group or to Sunday school, you know, the drop them off at the door kind of things. All of these things feed into the world of self-injury because this becomes their method of dealing with their incredible pain and their loneliness. Self-injurers will report that they feel very empty inside, regardless of whatever you see on the outside. They are stressed, they are unable to express their feelings, they're often very lonely, even if they have a large group of friends. They don't believe they're understood by other people. They're fearful of intimate relationships, and they're very fearful of adult responsibilities and failure. So self-injury is their way to cope or, or to relieve uh, the painful or hard to express feelings that they have. So um, I'd like for us to look now at the little diagram that I sent you, the, set, the cycle of self-mutilation. You should have gotten that along, you know, as one of the attachments that I sent you. So I don't have it up on the screen because it's too, uh, too big to put on there in a way you could actually see it. So I figured we would just look at the diagram. Um, the cycle of self-mutilation, and it says, you know, cutting, burning, hair pulling, head, head banging, eyeball pressing, biting, right? There is usually a traumatic episode, um, something that spurs this behavior into action. It could be abuse, neglect, or whatever. What, whatever this, the thing is, it is the trigger that begins these kinds of events. It can be prompted by a traumatic episode or a series of traumatic episodes, like uh, being abused or having others in the home that are physically abused, sexually abused. Neglect can be another trigger. Uh, it can also be something as, as, to an adult, simple as a relationship problem. Um, you know, just as a matter of full disclosure here, when I was in high school, I was a self-injurer. Um, I was the, the kid that um, would scratch in my arm uh, with a pin. I, you know, I would scratch a name in my arm or I would just you know, use a pin to scratch gouges. Um, because back then I was a pot smoker, I would also heat up the, the pot pipe bowl and I would burn my arm with that as a way to try and relieve the pain. And back in those days, it was over a boyfriend, you know, a, a guy that I wanted to like me that didn't like me or somebody that didn't wanted to pay me more attention that wasn't paying me attention. So it can be something as from an adult's perspective, simple as that. Um, 
what it really comes down to, there is an inability to resolve some sort of pain, um, rage or anger or frustration. There could be self-hate or blame. And all of this stuff creates this toxic stew of emotion, raw emotion that the, the teenage or, or the child struggles to verbalize or articulate in any way. And so these kinds of things are they're just internalized within that person. Um, they, they don't think it, there's a safe environment for them to begin to express this stuff. And so it all rolls around within and is, um, is toxic to how they function. Now, you've heard that, I'm sure, some people will uh, break things when they're angry. You know, they'll, they'll smash something or they'll throw it at the wall. But when a person turns to self-injury, they, they struggle with doing that. So they jam it all inside. Um, this can also turn into a form of self-hatred. Um, it may be that self-injurer hates her body or she hates herself for some reason that she can't express. So the person be, is really struggling with unbiblical thoughts. They're struggling with unbiblical beliefs about themselves. They may be um, thinking, thought, thinking things like, well, I am to blame for whatever is going on in the family, in the home, or whatever has happened to them. They may have a, um, a wrong belief about you know, themselves, like I'm, I'm stupid, or I'm an idiot, or I'm never gonna succeed, I'm a total failure, I don't know how to be who my parents or um, my educators expect me to be. Uh, whatever's happened is all my fault. If only I would have done, if only I would have said, then this never would have happened. Or a sense of hopelessness that the situation that they're in is never going to change. Or they somehow deserve what happened to them. Um, if, there's been a, a, if they've been sexually assaulted or if they have been um, you know, harmed in some other way, they may believe that they're to blame. They may have wrong beliefs that they're bad, evil, worthless. They may think no one is listening to them. They cannot or are not being heard. What's taking place in their life is something beyond their ability to cope with. And so this is how I'm going to um, deal with, with it. They might say things like, I can't handle this. I can't handle what's happening in my life. Uh, they may have a, a, um, a self-condemning uh, thought process of um, how could I have done this? How could I have been so stupid? How could I have um, participated in this? Um, we find young women after they have an abortion will be thinking, you know, how could I do this? Or how could I have, you know, hurt my child in this way? How could I have been so stupid? How could I believe the lies? Um, and you'll frequently hear them talking about being angry, but then they will also say that there are no words that can express how I am feeling. So there's this, this whole roiling kind of um, emotional stew that's going on within them. And so they turn to the self-harm or the self-mutilation, believing that this is what puts me in control. This is how I can deal with this. So it's really a matter of pride because they are turning away from God and turning to themselves for the answer, um, punishing themselves in their self-harming. It's how they're expressing anger over what they've gone through. Uh, biblically, we can look at this as a form of rebellion toward God because, again, I am, I am um, rebelling against what God's word tells me to do, and I am taking all these matters into my own hand, and I am going to handle this my way. Uh, God is not sufficient. There is no other method or means by which I can relieve my pain, all of which are lies and uh, rebellious actions. 
Uh, she also cuts or harms herself, believing this is going to help her to somehow feel, okay? Um, people will describe themselves, despite all of this that's rolling around inside of them, as being emotionally numb and, and unable to feel. But that's not actually the case. Uh, the, you know, the, the cutting is what they say enables me to feel something. Um, they believe that the, uh, the self-injuring behavior will help them to deal with the pain of their experience, and it will relieve the pain of their anger, sadness, loneliness, shame, or guilt. Uh, Self-injurers often express, well, this makes me feel alive. Seeing the blood makes me feel alive. It helps me to know I am alive. And it helps me to just release all of the pain that I have inside of me. So when the self-injurer, you know, completes their injurious behavior, they discover they have a temporary relief. They have a sense of, of a regained control. Right? When I do this, then I am actually doing something about what it is that is bothering me, hurting me, amiss in my world. So they have a temporary sense of satisfaction, believing their own lie, essentially. They experience an emotional relief. They will have a, a temporary sense of calm and peace. However, it's Th this relief and this um, result is very short-lived because what quickly uh, follows this is a, a sense of shame and a sense of fear that their actions or that the actions at the actions they have taken. Um, they realize that while they cut themselves and had a temporary sense of release or they pulled their hair or banged their head that um, the release is short-lived and the problem that prompted the action is still there. So this is what leads to the cycle that you see on the diagram in the cycle of self-mutilation. It all centers around unbiblical thoughts, unbiblical beliefs, and unbiblical desires that the person is dealing with. So I think at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to open this up and see what kind of questions that you have um, regarding um, what uh, I've been talking about with you and uh, get some feedback from you, um, hear what it is that you've been dealing with before I go any farther. Julie, I know Kelly had a question that she sent to me in private chat. So. Uh -huh. Kelly, maybe we could start with your question. She disappeared. Uh-huh. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Um, what about those who are indulged in their tattoos? I have to turn you up a minute because I can't hear you. I'm sorry, oh, could you repeat that? People who love to put tattoos, are they self uh, uh, self-indulgent? Tattoos? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, that's a really good question. I think depending on other things in the person's life, um, many, you know, like overwhelming full body tattoo kind of things can be in some cases uh, self-harming, self-injurious behaviors. Um, you may have seen some of those pictures on the internet where you, you get the real extreme people that like have bolts implanted under their skin. Um, they have, you know, lips and faces that are full of, you know, metal objects. I don't know any world in which that is not self-injurious behavior. Now, they may not view it that way. They may view it as expression, you know, personal expressions. I think we could all agree just on the face of it that people that do those kinds of things are very troubled. And they definitely have other things going on in their lives that cause them to rebel um, toward normal, cultural, acceptable norms that would 
you know, make that acceptable in their world. So, you know, I wouldn't say that everybody that gets tattoos is self-injuring, um, but I think you could make a case for it with some of the people that you see out there that are pretty extreme. Um, Cindy had a question, I think is, is um, a, an interesting one. She asked if masturbation is a form of self-injury. I think when it is, um, when it is intended to be painful, okay, when masturbation is used as a form of self-punishment, um, you know, to, um, I got to think of how I want to say this, um, not everybody that masturbates is self-injurious for with the motive of being harmful. Okay. There are people that masturbate as a result of watching pornography and they, they do it as a physical release or they believe that it's okay to watch pornography and masturbate. But there are people that be, you know, behave in this way, um, with intent to cause themselves pain. And in that case, it is a form of self-injury. I don't know if that is the whole content of your question, and I certainly welcome additional feedback or, you know, if you want to take that question further, I'm fine with that. Yeah, Cindy, if you'd like to ask more, go ahead and unmute and you can ask. Um, Another really interesting question, I know you're going to kind of get to this a little bit later, but uh, at what point does a counselor involve the parents in the process when the behaviors are disclosed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am going to get to that. Can I, can I hold off on that one? Would you just put a pin in that one, Warren, and, and bring that one back to me after the next segment here? I think that might be more helpful. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the thing about masturbation, we asked if that was, if that was true in teens too. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would, um, I, I would have a hard time assigning it in a teen. I, I've never heard of it in, in teens. Um, but of course, I don't have the wealth of all the experience in the world. Okay. Um, and maybe it is. But usually when teens are masturbating, it is much more for the pleasure that they gain from it. Yeah. I, I do know that there, I, I deal with that kind of counseling a lot. And one of the things I've run into is, what, especially with, with a teen, is, is because they know their parents severely disapprove, mm -hmm. it's a way of, of, of piling on shame on themselves that they, they believe they're deserving of. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's, it is an emotional self-harm. It's a vehicle for that. But uh, it, like you said, it's, it's not a common motivation at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kelly had a question. Kelly, you want to ask your question? I'm just stuck on a term that you used earlier when you were talking about the anorexia <clears throat> and the um, obese. Uh -huh. the word, I think you said tropic in her appearance. No, I didn't. Cherubic. 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 Uh, yeah, like a cherub. Oh, okay. Round face. She had gotcha. a real round face, and she was Thank just you. real round. Gotcha. And, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, this is a really good question. Um, what about swallowing objects? How might this differ from other forms of self-harm? Ha, this she has a young woman who has swallowed nail clippers, two stones, mosaic glass, batteries. Yeah, there is a name for that that I can't recall right now. Um, th yeah, that is some seriously disturbing, self-harming behavior. Um, people that that there was actually a TV show about that for a while, um, where people were swallowing all sorts of bizarro objects. And um, it is, uh, you're wandering into some pretty intensive method of self-harm that would go along with like the ha hitting yourself with the hammer and the breaking bones 
and those kinds of behaviors. So yes, that is definitely self-injurious behavior. Yeah, a lot of times it's seen it's something that is seen with uh, prisoners. Uh, people who are incarcerated is something that's very common. Mm -hmm. be, um, and that has to do with a powerless sense of powerlessness. I do know that. I've worked with that too. Um, oh, yeah. Somebody else trying to ask a question? Um, how, I noticed that so far the examples you gave are people by themselves. They don't usually clump in groups, do they? No. Um, uh, unlike some other, um, uh, so, you know, behaviors that are harmful, okay, you know, like drink, taking drugs or, um, you know, alcohol or even, you know, group sex, um, the self injurer tends to be fairly isolated because there is quite a bit of shame that goes along with this behavior. Um, they typically don't want people to know that they're doing this unless they're doing it for manipulative purposes. You know, like I talked about the teenager that once discovered then uses the self harming behavior, the tool to get mom and dad to do what they want to do. Um, hang on a second. Laura, you had your hand up. Go ahead. I do. I, it kind of goes along with your question about um, when you should involve the parents. Mm -hmm. What if you're not in a counseling situation, but you, you notice that kind of behavior, like say with a child's friend or just um, someone that is in your circle, at what point, maybe you'll go over this later as well, how do you um, let that person know that you are there to help them or, you know, do, do you know what I'm getting at? Like, how do you insert yourself in order to be able to help these people? Yeah, well, I think, you know, in the situation that you're describing, right, you have to have a relationship with that person, okay? If it's, you know, if you're, are you talking about like a, a teenage, a friend of your teenage daughter? Or Yeah, it could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have... Several yeah. of those teenagers around, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to have a relationship with that kid yourself. Um, and the last thing that you want to do is to put it on your child, your teenager, to try and intervene in that person's life. Okay? You don't want to be behind the scenes coaching them to say, you know, uh, you know, my child, I can see your friend has got this problem. This is what I want you to do. This is how, you know, they've got all this pain bound up inside of them. I want you to be a listening ear. I want you to be a friend because that puts your child in the place of having to deal with something they're not equipped to deal with. Okay. So you want to encourage your child to come to you and to talk to you about what they're observing. And then you can have a conversation with your child about about, you know, do you know what's going on in this kid's life? Do you know what kind of problems there are? Do you know what's going on in their home? And how do you think I can help? Or do you think I can, you know? And then if you can develop a relationship with that child that you suspect is in, you know, troubled, or if you already know that the home is a wreck, um, or, you know, the child has got some serious issues going on there, you can try and befriend the child or the, the teenager you can never take the place of the parent. Um, that would that would be really inappropriate. Uh, and then you might have to develop a relationship with the parent to see what kind of influence you can be there. Good. Uh, I have a question. Um, I was going to say, Jen, you have a question. Go ahead. Well, a lot of these, um, like with your um, with your model, I understand that like the self harm is all kind of combined. I'm used to like with the body focused repetitive behaviors like hair pulling and scabs and that kind of stuff being categorized as somewhat differently differently as more of a compulsion. Mm -hmm. And with those compulsions, like can you maybe bridge that gap for me um, on how your kind of like your umbrella is a little bit larger. But the people that I've spoken to that have the body focused um, repetitive behaviors are 
generally not looking to experience pain. They feel relief. There's a release, especially with the hair pulling, mm -hmm. um, but not so much the pain, especially with the scab removal, because I've had personal conversations with them. So I was just curious, like what your feelings and thoughts are about that. Um, not all self-injurers are interested in the pain. Okay. The self-injurers are interested in the release that comes from the pain. No matter what, no matter what, um, you know, when you're talking about hair pulling and you're talking about cutting, okay, which are the two most common forms of self-injury. What they are after is the payoff that comes from the behavior that they're undertaking. Um, and so I, I guess I don't see uh, in the people that I have um, met, met with, I don't see a difference. Um, I don't see a difference in whether it is um, a repetitive or isolated situation. And maybe I'm not understanding your question. Yeah, I think they just like in in my world, they're um, they're two separate. Self harm is like intentional to harm yourself for either intention or for mm -hmm. that release. Mm -hmm. like the hair pulling and scab picking, it's like there's uh, it's a way to check out, but it's not an intentional self harm. Is the way that I have been, I've learned that it is. But I, that's all I was just saying. Like if you have if. How do you differentiate those at all? Or it's just all under the self-harm umbrella for you? Okay, I understand what you're asking me now. Yeah. It is all under the self-harm umbrella. And um, when we start talking about the reasons why people self-harm from a biblical perspective, I think um, maybe you'll understand the reason that it's all under the same umbrella. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. It, that is, it is about who's power and control. It's about who's going to be sovereign over what I'm having to deal with. Right. That's the biblical perspective. Right. And I mean, cause then when, when, what you're really talking about is habituation. Okay. Right. A person who is, you know, hair pulling, um, and they say, you know, like I talked about my counselor that she would just start by twirling her hair. Well, this, this was a habit that she developed. She would just twirl and twirl and twirl. And twirl. Before long, she, while she was doing something else, okay, uh, she would be reading a book and would be pulling her eyebrows or pulling her eyelashes, and she would come back and say, "Well, I wasn't, I wasn't even aware I was doing it." Okay, but th that and that's where the habituation of that kind of a behavior comes in. But it still all comes down to the same roots. That was helpful because I think um, the issue that I was, you know in my mind was just that a lot of times they don't realize that they're doing it. That's the compulsive component of that. And so, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And so the yeah. question that I'll give you to think about Jen is um, whether or not it is conscious or unconscious at that point, are they still sinning and are they still needing to repent? I think the methodology of being able to approach the two different though, because you have a person that's intentionally cutting, I would imagine that you're counseling them very different from someone who's unaware because our whole strategy was to make that person aware of what they were doing while they're reading a book or sitting on a couch. So I think I was just getting into the methodology of it a little bit too. Yeah. Well, the other thing to keep in mind is generally by the time a person comes to some, to any of us for counseling for this issue, they're very aware of what they're doing because they've been made aware of what they're doing, either by having giant bald spots on their heads or no eyebrows or no eyelashes or people commenting that they're doing this behavior, right? And that it has become, you know, habituated. So, you know, we generally don't get people that have been hair pulling for two weeks, right? We get people that are entrenched in these behaviors 
and are aware that they are entrenched in these behaviors because they're coming to us for help. Right, Whether but they're really about results. And I think the hardest part was to just get that person aware of when they were doing it. Not so much that the, if they're doing it. It's more like when they're sitting on a couch and bored as, mm -hmm. you know, they're pulling their hair, as they're mm -hmm. checking out or whatever they're doing to feel that release uh, or it was, it was in this case about boredom. Mm -hmm. So because this was a developed, like you said, habit, it was, it was not that the person wasn't aware that they had the habit with the no eyebrows and the half the hair gone. It was more like, how do you bring about the self-awareness? Like I'm sitting on the couch. I need to make sure my hands are on my lap or, mm -hmm. you know, just that's, I think the methodology piece. And I don't even know if that's the right word, but well, that I, was, one, yeah. I think, Jen, I think one of the important things we have to remember is that we cannot just deal with symptoms. We have to deal with the whys. Right. And that's what we're going to get into. Right. Okay. Right. Um, there are two questions. Uh, we need to take a break here pretty quick, but um, the, uh, what if you have someone who has a history of self-harm is now talking about suicide? Well, anytime a person is talking about suicide, you know, you need to be responsible and, uh, you know, do the suicide check is what we call it at Raining Grace. You know, you need to find out, uh, you know, do they have means? Do they have method? Do they have opportunity? You know, can they tell you the story of suicide attempt in their head? All right. Uh, and you need to, you need to examine that closely. Um, and if necessary, you need to get them in a facility that will prevent them from suiciding. Okay. Um, you're you're going to have to deal with all of the underlying issues anyway. Yeah, we mess around with that. Um, if we have a person that has been self-harming, and I, it would depend on how they've been self-harming in the past, okay? If these are people that have been self-harming with, you know, razor blades and knives, and now they're start, starting to talk about cutting their wrists, okay, well, that is a, that's a 911 in our world. We don't like to do that, and I, I truly wish that there were uh, alternatives to the secular a world that where we have to turn them over to, you know, the the emergency room with the psychologist and the psychiatrist and and all that that world brings. Uh, I wish we had a biblical alternative where we had a place that we could send them that was emergency room like with a biblical form of intervention that would accomplish the same goal but we don't have that because usually what happens is they come out of these places drugged to the gills with numerous psychiatric diagnosis from the DSM-5 and then they get on that merry-go-round which only adds to the problems and never really solves anything. Yeah. We got time for one more and then we're gonna take a break. Hannah, you have a really good question. You wanna ask that? So what is our cultural obsession with um, shows like 13 reasons why like with our teenagers and how much do we need to censor that with our kids because clearly my daughter's friends are watching the show and we've almost normalized it or sensationalized it um i watched both seasons of 13 reasons why and um i did a talk on this in sarasota florida a couple of years ago um because of this cultural obsession I watched the first season of 13 Reasons Why. Um, what I came away with for, uh, based on the counseling that I do with young adults is that what you see in that series is their real lives. Now, of course, they smash everything into 13 episodes, okay? But the stuff that, that these kids are dealing with in 13 Reasons Why, that is current high school life. And I think the teenagers that are watching this show, what they are seeing is um, where art meets life for them. All of the stuff that happens in that series that's all real to them. They're dealing with those kinds of kids. You know, they're dealing with, you know, the, the girls that are, their reputations are being, you know, slandered and destroyed. 
because they are, uh, you know, texting and sexting and Facebook and Instagram and all of these social media things. This is real. It's their real lives. We are in serious, serious trouble as a culture. Mm -hmm. And anybody that thinks that what goes on in 13 Reasons Why isn't real life, I'm afraid you, you just are, you're outside of what real mainstream America is like right now. There's another very powerful movie that Netflix has and it's a girl like her. And it's just one particular girl targeted by one particular girl. And the backstory for the gal that's be doing the bull bullying, um, it's another one of those, it really captures in microcosm that whole idea. Not as sensationalized as 13 Reasons Why, but um, I've known several teenagers who've seen that and just could really identify with the story. So some of it is very helpful, but I think, like you're saying, 13 Reasons, 13 Reasons Why almost makes it too large for larger than life for them yeah yeah it, it it's it's really beyond i think you know on one hand they're seeing somebody gets it yeah somebody sees what my life is really like and on the other hand you know like us adults that see this they're kind of horrified that is this all there is yeah is this all there is for me where is the hope and that is that is the danger of 13 reasons why yeah. there is no hope there it, you know there the inmates are running the zoo yeah. yeah and that is real life for our teens in way 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 too many cases and that is why we are seeing this explosion of these self injurious behaviors like i said in the opening these kids are facing things they are not equipped to deal with and nobody's equipping them. Nobody's equipping them. You know, we have this whole generation of adults, at least chronological adults, that, that were not raised by, you know, adults. They were raised by, you know, 60s hippies. And they, they are not taught. And there's no God involved in their lives. There's no hope. It's really tragic. It's really, really tragic. I think on that sad note, we need to take <laughs> take a quick break. Come, let's come back in eight minutes, okay? So anybody has to, you know, 